Welcome to Cooking with Dr. Trindade. I was inspired to do this by several of my patients, uh, one of which is a physician who had never cooked before, as happens with some of my other patients, and said, could you just do some very basic videos for those of us who haven't cooked, but we're sort of inspired to after talking to you and trying to implement that 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit per day. And your theory about how if you can get that, those amount of vegetables, you're in much sort of healthier stead, not just in COVID-19 times, but in general. Um, and then the next question was, well, how do I get all those in? And I'm constantly reminding them how you can make soups that are cream soups, but they're cream of vegetables. You're not adding any cream, dairy cream that is. And uh, so then the next thing was, well, if I could just have a short video and make it simple, just keep it really simple. So that really inspired me to do this and to keep it simple. Now, whenever you are cooking yourself, whether you're making soups or anything else, please just be creative. You can add a lot more things and um, you can experiment with different flavors. But for now, I'm keeping it really basic because I want to inspire those of you who think you can't cook to cook because you really can. So welcome and let's get on with cooking. Welcome everyone to Cooking with Dr. Trindade. And today we're going to make a beet soup. Mmm, I already have some chopped up in here. So beets are rich in zinc. They are a little bit higher on the glycemic load, but we're gonna make this as our base with lots of different spices. And then we're gonna add some greenery to it. So it will, it will um, decrease that sort of glycemic um, load. But even so, they are just filled with so many um, phytonutrients that it sort of offsets that. You know, some years ago, um, I started really getting into the difference in um, studies as well as foods when you look at some of the studies from the US, for example, versus Europe. One example, Europeans eat a lot of fruit. They always have fruit after their lunch and dinner, and then they may have a dessert, but in most cases, the fruit is a dessert. And in the US, we've shied away from eating that much fruit, unfortunately, or maybe it was never sort of our cultural habit. But in any case, when you look at studies in diabetics about fruit, most studies in the US say diabetics need to stay away from fruit. And that's not exactly true. Diabetics and pre-diabetics need to stay away from the high glycemic load fruits, like grapes and cherry and pineapple, for instance, or eat very little of it, and bananas to be another. But the low glycemic load fruits, like all your berries and your kiwi, for example, and even some of your medium ones, like apples and pears and oranges, because they're also filled with fiber, that lowers the glycemic response. So in other words, fiber, well, instead of having your sugar peak, it will help it, it will make it increase slightly, but then it prolongs the effect at a lower amount. And that's exactly what happens with beets. Now, the other thing about beets is they are loaded with nitric oxide and they help our bodies make nitric oxide. I'm just going to sort of peel a little bit off of this one and then uh, chop it. So what, it, why is nitric oxide so important? Well, nitric oxide is what is a va vasodilator. So it helps our blood vessels vasodilate, but it also works to keep the inner lining of our blood vessels, especially our arteries, really healthy. So you can, you can actually measure someone's nitric oxide level. So beets are extremely important. Think of nitric oxide, right? And that that in turn is gonna help protect you from vascular problems, whether it's a stroke or, or a heart attack. And in general, just keep your blood vessels nice and healthy, uh, which you would especially consider if you have high blood pressure. So beets are your friend, even though they are a little bit higher in the glycemic load. Let's see, I need a better knife for this one. So I'm actually gonna borrow Susan's handy knives. Is that okay, my dear? And um, you can decide however, how, how big you want them. Now, I like to chop, uh, not too big, and, and many times I'll, I'll also roast them. So I'll chop them, uh, and some of them are gonna be cooked for us to make the base of a soup, and others will be roasted. You can roast them with coconut oil, for instance, and um, 
this is something that keeps really well. You can also cook them and then freeze them. And um, what I usually do, because beets are not cheap, is whenever they're on sale, I'll buy quite a bit. And you can freeze them just as they are. Like I'll sort of clean them out and pare them a little bit. And then you can wrap them in parchment paper and then freeze them in like a Ziploc bag, for instance. The reason why I like wrapping in parchment paper is because number one, it keeps the freshness. But the other thing is that then parchment paper in comparison to your plastics is healthier. There's less toxicity associated with it. And also, um, you, know, you could vacuum pack them, but if I'm gonna vacuum pack a vegetable, I will, and then freeze it, I will first wrap it in parchment paper. So here are my beets, and we are going to then dip them into some boiling water, and then I'll be creaming them to a base of a soup. So this is a soup that takes a little bit longer um, to cook because you're gonna simmer it for about an hour, but you basically are gonna add some spices to your boiling water, and then you're gonna add the beets, and they will simmer over an hour and then you will cream the whole thing. Just realize this one takes a little bit longer uh, to cook. You're gonna be putting, uh, this is three sort of medium sized beets. You're gonna be putting this into about eight cups of boiling water. Onto the stove. So continuing on with our beautiful beet soup, I like adding my spices first doesn't you don't necessarily have to do that so we're going to do a half a teaspoon of salt and i really like the himalayan sea salts some years ago i was involved with a group that actually looked at the different types of salts and sort of how much uh, toxicity and heavy metals there are and himalayan came up on the top so it's one of the reasons why i use it now um, you will be adding more salt later but for the beets to cook and for really to get their flavor as well as their more of their minerals out, we add the salt right now. And then these are the spices that I'm using. This recipe actually you could also use um, your um, dill and um, fennel, but because I didn't have any, we're going to do it with cabbage. So just know that you can substitute. So we have our spices here. We have one teaspoon of your caraway seeds and then one teaspoon of your fennel seeds and just a quarter teaspoon of ground allspice so we're just going to add all those in see how beautiful they are and they smell ever so nicely we're adding that and then we're going to add our beets remember these are the three medium sized beets and my water is already boiling and then you could do your fennel bulb, one fennel bulb, or you can do cabbage. I'm going to do one cup of finely chopped, sort of shredded cabbage. And um, because we sh I chopped it up pretty small, or at least as Susan did, then I packed it a little bit. You could add more or less. And we're going to be adding all that in. And then we're going to let it boil or simmer for an hour. It's already boiling, as you can see. And now we're just going to put the lid on it and let it boil for about an hour. And then I'll show you how we're going to cream it and then add the rest of the spices to it. So this beet soup also calls for onion. And remember I mentioned that I didn't have any red onion? Well, it turns out that I actually found some. So it's one cup of chopped up onion. And if you use the red onion, of course, you get more of the quercetin. You also get quercetin in the uh, skin of apples, for instance. Remember, it's a great antioxidant. It helps decrease inflammation in your gut. And it's actually been shown to protect our immune system from COVID-19. So from the, the virus of COVID-19, we're just going to add that to it. Now, one really important detail and that is that when you put the lid on, you want to make sure that you leave it just a little bit ajar so that the steam can escape because you are boiling this for um, an hour. So you want to make sure that we don't put the lid all the way, that you sort of let it breathe. And then you're bringing it to a boil and then we'll let it simmer for an hour. Actually, it's been now more maybe 50, 55 minutes. 
longer. Continuing on with our beet soup. Remember, it's a base uh, of beet. We're going to cream it because we're trying to get that fiber and all those servings, right? We want 8 to 10, I'm sorry, 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit. I usually say 8 to 10 of vegetables and then 2 of fruit. So continuing on with our recipe. And by the way, all these recipes will be available on my website. There will be a link so you can get the recipe from my website. We're going to do 1 tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and it's important to add it towards the end because it um, gives it a little bit richer flavor and then we're just going to cream it. We're going to use my trusty hand mixer. I'm just tilting it because I'm trying to not splatter everywhere. As you know, beets are red and so they tend to stain. But if you, you can also use a smaller pot, and, uh, but in either case, you can tilt it and then it won't splatter so much. Because I really like using the hand mixer right in the pot. So you have this just amazing red color. Just think of how that is going to communicate with your DNA and decrease the amount of inflammation in your body, increase your nitric oxide levels. Isn't that amazing? And to me, what I find super amazing is that when you are conscious of what a certain vegetable is doing to your body, it increases its effect fivefold, up to fivefold, maybe even more. We haven't done those studies, we don't know. Now. You can use your Vitamix or regular blender if you'd like. I just love hand blenders and I, if it's really easy on the cleanup, so I like doing it directly in the pot. I just want you to see the consistency of it. You could make it thicker if you'd like. Remember we used eight uh, cups of water and we did three medium-sized beets. Now this is your base. You can add almost anything you'd like to it. Let me show you some examples. So I have some chopped up organic broccoli. And the nice thing about this broccoli is that I like using the stems. And so what I'll do is you basically just peel out the thicker outer part of the stem and then we just chop that up. If you're going to do broccoli, you probably would want to put it back on the stove and cook it for about another five, three to five minutes, depending on how much of the uh, nutrients of the broccoli you want to retain. Usually I'll just do three minutes. It'll be a little bit al dente and that way you have access to all of the glucosinolates. Now glucosinolates are an ingredient in the broccoli itself that when you then chew it, we have something in our saliva called myrosinase and it increases the sulforaphane, which is a very, another very powerful antioxidant. It's one of those that turns on our own antioxidant processes in our cells. So that's one option that you could then add. The second is you could add some, this is celery, you could add some celery, and that I probably would only cook it for about another two to three minutes, depending on how sort of um, soft you'd like it. Or you could do my all-time favorite, arugula, and that you would, I would just do maybe a handful per cup. It's really up to you how thick you'd like it. Um, I usually will do like two cups for a, a meal, and so then you could be adding a cup to a two cups of the arugula. And then one thing that I find goes really well with this soup is cabbage. Now, this is just your regular organic white cabbage. You can also do it with a purple cabbage if you'd like. That again, you'd want to put it back on the stove and cook it for a little longer. You could also just do some herbs. I have uh, some cilantro and parsley. So you could just rough chop that and put that in there as well. You could add some chicken. You could add some beef. You could add some cooked beans that you may have had. It's really up to you. Then what I wanted to instill in you is that you have a base and now here I've just shown you four or five different additions that you can add. So if you make one big, or I should say one bigger batch of the soup, you can have it for the whole week, but each day you're adding something different to it. So it almost seems like a whole new soup. And you can add both, let's say an herb. So I have some parsley here. You can add the parsley and the cabbage. It's really up to you. 
you could even add a meat source or a, a, a protein source to that as well. The sky's the limit. Once you have the bases, or I should say the soup base, you can do whatever you'd like. Invent, you know, be adventurous and enjoy. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Cooking with Dr. Trindade. And just remember the importance of food and how food communicates with our DNA. And just like the eating the wrong food can increase inflammation, eating the right foods can decrease inflammation and make our gut microbiome, our immune system healthier, more robust, more able to deal with all these foreign invaders. And don't forget about my rule of 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit. And these soups go a long way to really showing you how you can incorporate that much, or so I should say that amount of uh, vegetables into your diet. Because when you're doing a creamed soup, just in the one serving, you're actually getting four to five servings of the vegetable. Because remember, it's half a cup cooked is equal to one serving, or one cup raw, like a cup of arugula, or a cup of lettuce, or a cup of spinach. That would be one serving, whereas half a cup of cooked asparagus, or half a cup of cooked broccoli, or Brussels sprouts, for instance, that is a serving. But when you're doing the base of your soup as a creamed soup, a creamed vegetable soup, you're getting four to five servings per meal because you're getting all that amount in the base, or in the cream, Plus, you are adding, right? Whether we're adding cabbage or spinach or broccoli or cauliflower, you name it, you are adding to it. So it's easy. If in one meal you can get four to five servings, in your next meal you can get another four to five, and then you have one meal where you may be getting one or two. Maybe you're doing more of your fruits. So extremely, extremely important. And remember, we're getting both soluble and insoluble fiber. It's true that your soluble fiber is more your nuts and seeds, things like your flaxseed meal, for instance, or your chia seeds, but you're also getting some of that, like in the asparagus, for instance, or in your carrots. You know, you, it's really important that we remember that it's the soluble fiber that really feeds our gut microbiota. So make it a great day. Please enjoy my recipes. And thank you so much for your participation and for your information. You inspire me, and I so, so appreciate that. My best to you.